Well, good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back to the Literary Translation Center. I'm Jonathan Hayward. I'm director of English Pen. It's a real pleasure to be here again and to see the Translation Center so, so getting bigger every year and, and more and more people coming along every year. Um, and as ever, thank you to London Book Fair and the Arts Council for making this space um, possible and the other funders. Um, this afternoon's event is, is a very special one to us at Penn because it marks the launch of a very important new translation fund. I'll say myself uh, a few words about that and what it means to us at, at Penn in a couple of minutes. Um, I'm very glad to be joined by my colleague, Roz Schwartz, very distinguished translator in her own right, but also currently the chair of um, English Pen's Writers in Translation Committee. And in a few minutes, Roz will, 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 will talk about the new scheme. I'm sure you're all very interested, mostly interested to hear how it will work and how publishers and translators may be able to benefit from the new scheme, which we, we hope will allow more books in translation to be published, to reach more readers, and to show more languages being translated into English. That's the big aim behind the scheme. Before I um, hand over to Roz, I'll say a little bit myself, but before that, I'm going to ask Antonia Byatt, Director of Literature at the Arts Council. Antonia has been an incredibly um, active ally and supporter in this uh, campaign that we're all engaged in to get more readers reading more in translation for, for several years now in her role at the Arts Council. And I think this new, the, 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 the new scheme that we're launching today marks an evolution in that relationship. So uh, to, to begin with, please welcome Antonia Byatt. Well, for, the, for those of you who don't know what Arts Council England is, um, it's, the, it's the body that funds the arts in England and our, our sort of mission is great art for everyone. And that means we have a dual role in supporting the best art possible to be made in this country. So supporting the artists that make it and the organisations and the conditions that help artists make art. Um, but also to get it out to as many people as possible so that they can enjoy it. Um, and in that context, the international context for arts in this country is, is really, really important. Um, you can't imagine the visual arts, galleries or museums or music indeed not somehow being networked across the world and absolutely the same applies to writers and we want to see our writers working in an international context and we want our readers to enjoy the benefit of the huge range of work that's available across the world as much as is possible. Um, and I suppose, I, I think it's really important that writers are exposed to writers who are writing in different languages, from different places, with different kinds of imaginations and ideas. That's an extremely important part of the creative process. Um, and I, in one of my last jobs, I used to work at the South Bank Centre, which ran a big poetry, international poetry festival. And I remember looking back at that festival in its earlier days in the 1980s and, and realizing how incredibly important the Eastern European poets uh, like Miloš and Holub had been to some of our leading poets like Seamus Heaney or, or like uh, Ted Hughes um, and they had felt an incredibly strong connection with those poets at that point in time across Europe and part of that had been made possible because some really small independent publishers in this country had, and, and translators had gone out and translated that work so that poets here could read and understand it. Um, and it's incredibly, you can't imagine English literature or English writing um, being able to exist without those international influences, I think. So, you know, you, you can't have English literature without Dante or without Chekhov, um, and you can't have lots of contemporary writing without people like Kundera or Borges or Marquez. Um, and there are, I mean, the sad thing is there are probably a lot of other writers who would have influenced writers here, but they're, they're not translated. And so there's a huge unspoken um, amount of influence which I suppose is what we're also um, trying to make steps to cure to, to, to some extent. Um, 
We've just, that, that idea that artists and writers need to work in an international context to, to debate, meet, read, be exposed to each other's work um, is something that is increasingly important to us. And, and so we've just launched a new fund at the Arts Council, um, which is to help artists who are at just the point in their career where they're beginning to be recognised in this country and where they would really benefit from being able to go out and work with other artists or translators. Um, and... Um, and also develop their markets abroad. And so what this money does is kind of, it's like a sort of first toe in the water bit of funding um, for artists to go out and explore and to make connections and, and to make networks. And down the line, we think that that will bring fruits back and, and that will be, that, that's often the way they begin to um, get recognition in another country or they make contacts with writers uh, from other countries who they can help introduce into the English context here. So, so that's a new piece of funding which we're very excited by. We have supported translation uh, for quite a long time now. Um, and we do that, with, we still um, fund individual translations through our grants for the arts scheme. We fund organisations like PEN, which I'll talk about in a minute, but also um, like the Free Word Centre in London or Writers' Centre Norwich, which uh, have residencies, um, exchange programmes, seminars, um, and of course literature festivals, which are really important not only to introducing writers to readers here, but also a really good literature festival. It's like a sort of salon for writers, a place where they can meet and discuss and, and get ideas too. Um, but we're really excited about Penn's new venture, which they're going to talk about in a minute, because we think it's another way of giving even more emphasis to translation. And it also gives us a very good way of, of, of us all having a real kind of overview of what's coming in and relying on some incredibly skilled um, experts to, to help choose kind of um, what, 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 what we're able to fund through that scheme. So we, uh, and also Penn are absolutely dedicated to promoting writing and promoting debate and promoting different voices. Um, and that's seems like a really good context to have a translation fund working in. So, so they're going to talk about that in a minute and I think that's very exciting and I just wanted to finish saying I think the other thing for the Arts Council is that it's really really important to us that readers in this country don't, don't stay walled in in a, in a kind of parochial um, on, on the parochial island, so to speak, and that they can be exposed to as many different kinds of forms and ideas um, that, that writers from all over the world bring to us in their work. And so, so that joining of, of funding the work, but also funding the organizations that help get that work and those ideas out there is, is really important to us. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Antonia. It's, it's very inspiring um, to be reminded of that, that big international context. I mean, Penn exists in an international context. Penn was founded back in 1921 by a group of writers in this country who believed that writers could and should be more connected with each other around the world. And, and, and that the woman who founded Penn, a very, uh, in some ways, rather eccentric character. You know, people who change the world often are rather eccentric characters. She had this idea, what about a kind of literary league of nations that would allow writers from every country to come together to share experiences, to share culture, and to see would that not make the world a better place? And the amazing truth is that that network that she imagined back in 1921 does exist. And there are now pen centers in over 100 countries all over the world. And they represent writers, publishers, agents, translators, editors, journalists, everyone in the literary professions in those countries and it's, it's an incredibly powerful and living network. The way we interpret our role at English Pen as the founding center is we have various strands to our work. We campaign on behalf of writers around the world who aren't free to write and readers who aren't free 
to read. We campaign on behalf of imprisoned writers particularly, but also writers who may be at risk in other ways, journalists in Mexico who risk being assassinated because of their work exposing the drug cartels and, their, and the implicit corruption in the, in the Mexican uh, local government, for instance. Uh, so we're, we're very concerned with this issues of free speech at an international level. We also work on behalf of free speech at a UK level. If there are challenges, for instance, the way that the libel laws silence some writers and publishers from publishing material in the public interest, we've campaigned very vigorously for reform there. We work very closely with various very socially excluded groups in this country, prisoners, refugees, asylum seekers, newly arrived uh, young people in this country who may arrive not really speaking English. We try to help them not only to speak English, but to write English so they can tell us their stories, which may be the real story of their traumatic journey here, or fiction, poetry, drama, whatever they want to use that, that creative skill to express. And finally, but very importantly, we support translation. So for the last six years now, we've run a scheme which we're now, uh, we now think of as Pen Promotes, which has awarded publishers um, relatively small amounts of money, but enough money to enable them to bring over the author of a book that they may be publishing in translation. And we found that incredibly effective way of building audiences for those books. It's very hard for readers here to engage with, a, with, a, with literature from a country or a culture they may, may not be familiar with. But if they have the chance to meet the author, whether through a literary festival or an event or a bookshop reading or a reading in a library, or potentially even to hear that author on start the week, or to read an interview in The Observer, it all starts to build up recognition that that author is someone they can engage with. There's a story there that they may feel some sympathy with. And that's how you actually sell books in this country. So that scheme has now been running for six years. We've supported over 50 books with the backing of the Arts Council and Bloomberg, who have sponsored the, uh, the funding there. Over the years, we've also looked around the ecosystem of translation and realized, well, this is great, but it's a, kind of, it's a drop in the ocean, what we've been able to do. And there are other people doing very important work, and you've heard from some of them over the last couple of days at the Translation Center as well. But we did some research and tried to identify where are the remaining barriers in the, the translation ecosystem. Why is it that we still only have so few books, maybe 3%, maybe less, being published in English translation in this country? And there seems to be a combination of perceptual barriers and practical barriers. And one of the perceived barriers, especially among some publishers, is that readers actually aren't interested. Publishers will say it's very hard to sell these books to readers. Booksellers sometimes complain about the same thing. Literary journalists say, well, we won't review these books because we know that, that the booksellers aren't then going to stock them. And there's this kind of circular reasoning that actually means that fewer books get translated but it's, it's very much in the eyes of the beholder because if you actually ask readers or you put readers in front of a book in translation all they want to know is is it a good book is it going to resonate with me am I going to engage with this story and if they're given the chance to do that they will so we did a we did a, we did a, did, a, did a kind of exercise where we collected extracts from all I think the first 32 or 36 books that we would supported through the scheme put them into a little anthology or a sampler distributed that to libraries across the country, I think to about 300 library authorities and reading groups then took those samplers and they immediately wanted to read more from the books that they'd read little bite-sized extracts from. So I think those arguments that readers aren't interested are rubbish and they crumble the minute you put some actual opportunities in front of readers to engage with international literature. But there's still a lot more to do and that's why we're continuing with our pen promotes scheme as well to get those authors over here to put them in front of readers. But we realize there's a practical problem as well, and this is very much something that publishers um, brought to us, was that there are, there are funds available in this country, as, as Antonia has said, through grants for the arts. The Arts Council is, is actually a major backer for literary translation, and there are various cultural institutes as well which have funding available. But it's very piecemeal. There are different criteria for different schemes, different expectations, quite complex application pr procedures. And it's very uncertain as to know how to actually manage that system. And I know as someone who's responsible for raising funds as well for Penn, how frustrating it can be trying to juggle the expectations of many different, different funders with different requirements. So that's in a way where we then came together with, with Antonia and her colleagues at the Arts Council and began to think, well, maybe with the expertise that we've developed over the last few years, we could build on that and come in and support books, 
not only at the point where they've been translated, but much further upstream if a publisher or a translator is aware of a book that should be translated, which is a great book. Not just a book which may have some kind of, you know, this is not about doing books which are worthy, which, which, which you know, yes, in an ideal world, this book would be published. We're talking about books which actually there is a readership for these books. They're great books, they'll be properly published, and actually they're going to add something. They're going to add something to the literary scene that we don't already have. Um, we got those criteria clear and we agreed that actually, yes, we really wanted to take, take on this partnership with the Arts Council and work together so we can address not only that kind of perceptual barrier to increasing the flow of literary translation, but also address that very practical issue about having funds available with, we hope, a relatively straightforward application process and we hope relatively transparent decision-making process and criteria. So in a way, that's, that's where we've come from. That's how we've got to the point we're at now. This, this fund is in the process of being launched in this seminar. Half an hour ago, it didn't exist. In half an hour's time, it will exist. Um, this is the launch event. You're, you're witnessing a new translation fund coming into being. Uh, and to talk a little bit more about that, I'm, I'd, I'd like now to ask Roz to speak. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm going to run you um, quickly through, th through the programme. Um, you don't need to take notes because everything that I'm going to say with the PowerPoint presentation is on the website, which is going live this evening. So um, I'll just quickly talk you through it and then there will be time for questions afterwards. And I, I have to say that we are very, very excited about this programme and feel very privileged to have been entrusted with it. Okay, can you, can you all hear me? Okay, so this is, a, this is what the programme will fund. Translation costs and translation costs only for books being published in English translation. There are going to be two submission periods each year. One will be around April, May, June, and the other in November. And for each period, there is the sum of £60,000 in total, which includes the admin costs as well. So we should be able to fund about 10 books for each session, hopefully around 20 books a year. So. Publishers applying for these grants will complete an application form and we, we, we do have some examples here which we'll be passing around later for you to have a look at. And we've tried to make this as streamlined and transparent as possible. So in the form, you'll be asked to outline the proposal and how it meets the criteria for the programme. Um, a marketing and publicity plan and we place a lot of emphasis on this because there's no point just publishing books with funding and then the books disappearing so we're hoping to stimulate some creative thinking around the promotion of the books as well um, and also readership profile and outreach strategy and we're very happy to work with you to think about ways of doing this um, we'll need a synopsis of the work and the full manuscript in the original language because we, we will, the experts will be reading the books themselves. Um, obviously writer biography, the translator's CV um, and a letter from the rights holder confirming that the rights are available. Now let me explain this. We thought long and hard about this aspect and we're aware that for some smaller publishers uh, publishing a book in translation might not be possible if they haven't got funding. So they might not be able to actually acquire the rights before they know if funding's available. So what we're saying is you don't have to have acquired the rights, but obviously you need to inform the rights holder that you're applying and have a letter from them um, confirming that the rights are free. Um, need to know the budget. And there will also be a no double funding declaration because if you've applied for funding from another source, we need to know that and we can top up that funding. So if you've applied to a source of funding that will only fund up to 50%, then we wouldn't expect you to be applying to us for a lot more or if you get it, 
you need to make an arrangement so that you don't double fund and that's that's very important but we we do appreciate that some sometimes you need two different sources of funding um, we won't be asking for sample translations at this stage um, but for books that do receive funding we reserve the right to pay the second tranche subject to approval of the translation um, that's because we want to ensure that all the books that are published with this support are of the very highest quality. Um, the evaluation criteria, now we've um, developed some very, very clear guidelines and criteria which are all on the website. Um, and these criteria will be supplied to the applicants and to the assessors. So there are three main um, criteria for the funding. One is literary quality. As Jonathan was saying earlier, we want to support works that are of outstanding literary merit. And that will be judged on the quality of the original text and the quality of the application. And that's why we'll be working with experts in the languages, the cultures of the books, who will be able to evaluate the book in its entire literary and cultural context. The strength of the project, so we expect to see a strong plan for the book that identifies the target audience for the book, shows how the audience will be reached through a proper marketing publicity campaign that's been well thought out and gives a realistic estimate of the costs involved. And contributing to diversity, um, we want to ex expand the diversity of the books that are available to English readers and that means languages being translated that aren't often translated, subjects, authors that are new to the English publishing scene. We are trying to broaden the, the whole um, publishing scene with the books that we support. There's, there's a lovely word that was coined, I think it's by the French, which is bibliodiversity, like eco-diversity, and it's a word I like very much. I think what we're trying to do is contribute to bibliodiversity in the UK. Um, now, as I said earlier, we're going to be able to fund hopefully up to about 10 books with each round. And one of the things we'll be doing, once we've had all the applications assessed by the various experts, we will have a committee of seven who will decide on the allocation of the funding. Now, there might well be very many books that are worth supporting, but we're going to have to make a choice that gives us a balanced portfolio each time so that we don't end up with six books from one language, for example which might mean that some very worthwhile projects we're just not able to fund. It is a limited amount of money. We're going to do our very best to distribute it in a balanced way, um, but there are going to be some disappointments, which might not be to do with the fact that it's not a good quality application, simply because there happen to be a certain number of books from that language in that round. Um, so that's how the choice, the end choice will be made. It'll be weighing up all those different factors. So this is what the fund will support. So all literary genres, so fiction, non-fiction, poetry, plays, both for print and e-books. So quite a wide range of books. Um, Applications from any UK-based publishers, bearing in mind that this money has come from the Arts Council of England, so it has to be for UK-based publishers and books that will benefit readers in England. Um, a publisher can submit an application for more than one book at a time. Now, it could be part of a multi-title project, uh, or it could be several separate applications. As long as each application is on a separate form, you can apply for more than one book in any one round. The level of funding, we will support up to 75% of the translation costs. And that's based on the translator's fee, 
which we would expect to be in line with the current rate observed by the Translators Association. For publishers with a turnover of under 100,000 a year, they may apply for up to 100% of the translation costs. We are prepared to consider that um, for smaller, very small publishers doing very big books. These are the things that sadly the program can't support. We've had to draw the line somewhere. So not academic publications, not magazines, not publicity costs or overheads. It's purely for the translator's fee. Um, applications where the publisher is also applying for a Grants for the Arts award. You cannot apply to both for the same project. And there is a question on the application form asking about that. No resubmissions of the same title. I'm afraid that if, if the title has not been accepted, we can't have resubmissions. We just don't have the resources for that. Um, or applications for sample translations. It's for the whole project. So as I said earlier, the right situation is that you can apply without having acquired the translation rights, as long as you have contacted the rights holder and got their permission. Um, and the rights holder would need to inform both the publisher who is applying and Penn if this position changes. If they sell the rights in the meantime, they need to let us all know so as not to waste everybody's time. Um, there is a possibility, because you won't have uh, acquired the rights, that we might find two publishers applying for the same book, in which case we would inform everybody concerned. And the final decision as to who the, pu the, the rights holder sells the book to is going to be with them anyway. So what kind of projects are ineligible? Obviously, if the rights aren't available. If the translator fee isn't in line with the observed rate, now we would expect the fee to be in line with the rates. If it's not, and we are aware that sometimes publishers and translators make different arrangements, that's fine, but you would need to inform us as to what that arrangement is and why. Um, we can't give grants for translations that are already completed, um, nor if the publication date is actually before the announcements for the grants made. And with each round, you'll be told when the announcement is. It'll be several weeks because we have to have the time to send it out to the experts for the panel to meet. So there will be um, three or four months in between submitting and receiving a reply. Um, Obviously, it will be ineligible if the form is incomplete or if any of the supporting documents are missing. Now, we have tried to make this form as user-friendly as possible. The guidance notes give you a checklist of supporting documents. So we hope that the form will be straightforward. Um, and again, it will be ineligible if you're applying for grants for the arts funding or if the amount requested exceeds 75% of the cost, unless you are a small publisher, and we will ask to see your figures, your turnover figures. And again, if the publisher is not UK-based, we cannot grant funding. Um, just for reassurance, any applications that have been deemed ineligible will be reviewed by the selection panel. They will double check to make sure that a submission really is ineligible. So there's not going to be any, any, any question of, of you know, borderline cases or anything. We are going to do our best to make sure that every application that is valid is assessed. So how, what's, what's the evaluation process? What happens? So the Experts will be given the same criteria that the applicants are given. They will have very clear guidelines as to how to assess the applications. Um, and in the application form, there is space to say exactly how the application meets the criteria set out in the application pack. Um, 
If you have any queries about anything at all to do with the form or what you should be doing, then please contact the office before sending in the application. And I think at this point I should introduce the program manager, Emma Cleave, who is standing over there. Wave. This is Emma. Uh, um, and I would just like to say that Emma's done a fantastic job in putting together all the literature that you will be receiving and seeing on the website. And she is the program manager. So any queries, Emma's your person. Um, Feedback. Um, if your application has been unsuccessful and you ask us for feedback, we will provide feedback as far as we can, as far as resources permit, and let you know why that is. Um, how are the assessors recruited? So initially, um, in consultation with the existing Writers in Translation Committee, recommendations, process of recommendations, experts who are experts in the various languages and cultures. Um, at this stage, we're recruiting for experts in the languages that we expect to receive applications in, um, and we will recruit more experts as and when applications come in if we don't have somebody with that particular skill set. If you want to apply to be an expert assessor, and all this is on the website, then you can contact Mazin, at englishpen.org, who will be collating all the applications for assessors. So the assessors will be people with extensive experience within the translation field or the linguistic and um, cultural area of the book. Um, sorry, that's a repeat. Um, and then the assessors will score the applications against the established criteria. So we're aiming for, for parity in the way the applications are assessed. All the assessors will be working to the same set of criteria, using their knowledge to make the evaluation. And they'll be looking at literary quality first and foremost. I think that's the message you've been getting from everything that's been said so far. The strength of the project and contributing to bibliodiversity. So the assessors will review all the applications in each round and then their reports will go to a central panel, a selection panel made up of each time seven rotating members of the existing Writers in Translation Committee. And that panel will review all the applications and will then meet and arrive at their final decision. And again, you know, taking into account the need for balance. Um, and Penn will be providing extensive briefing guidelines and training if required for all the experts to make sure that everybody's singing from the same hymn sheet. Um, um, in case you're worried about conflict of interest, which is something that we're also worried about, experts and the selection panel members will be asked to sign a declaration of interest and to, to make sure that we avoid any bias or conflicts of interest. We're going to be very, very careful about that, of course. So the successful applicants will be notified and provided with a contract outlining the terms and conditions of the grant. They'll be asked to agree to those and sign the paperwork, which will then be countersigned by the program manager. On signature, publishers must provide a preliminary translation and publicity schedule. So we need to be kept informed of the progress. Payments, which is the bit you're, you've all been waiting for. Um, the grant will be paid in two installments in line with the publishing schedule. So we would expect, as is recommended in the Translators Association contract, that translators to be paid 50% on signature of the contract and 50% on delivery of the translation. And we will be paying the grant in line with that timetable. Um, before processing the first payment, we would ask to see a copy of the rights contract, so we need to know that you have by now um, acquired the rights and the translator contract. 
Um, once the paperwork has all been signed, then the publisher will submit an invoice, which will be paid straight away um, for the amount agreed. Um, in some cases, we may ask to see the translation. It might be that the translator is unknown, it's the first translation, or the publisher's unknown. Um, we're not going to systematically read every single translation. Um, monitoring publishers who are in receipt of a grant will be asked to evaluate and provide feedback on the project. We've worked very hard to make sure that this project works for everybody, but obviously this is the first round. We're very, very open to your comments and feedback, and we hope to be able to improve it as we go along in the light of any comments that we receive. Um, now, I've called this bit sharing success. If a book that is funded by PEN achieves outstanding and unexpected sales, let's say over 50,000 copies, we've, we would suggest a donation uh, to just to help ensure the continuity of the fund. We're not making this a condition and we're not insisting on it, but it would be very much in the spirit of PEN if a publisher who has been able to publish a book thanks to a grant from us um, were to want to put something back. So we would ask you to bear that in mind. And it's a bit like the optional gratuity in restaurants. In the guidelines, we've suggested contributions. And let's hope you all have these runaway successes. Um, here's the website, um, www.englishpen.org uh, forward slash translation forward slash pen uh, hyphen translates. Everything is on the website. And now if you've got any questions, we'll be very happy to answer them. Thank you very much, Ros. Yes, there's a question right here. Is there a, I think there's a microphone coming. Um, will you include novels for children and teenagers? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Why not? Yeah. That was novels for children and teenagers. Is there one right here? There's quite a lot of hands. Oh, we have quite, I have to say we have quite limited time, so this is great. Snappy, quick yeah. questions. Very quick question. Um, is it starting this May, June? Uh, yes. Yes. Now. This when is you it. go home and switch on your computer, it will be live. There's at the back, yes, yeah, Stephen. Can you get it? Thanks, yeah, uh, trying to be uh, very quick. Um, in terms of the assessors and the experts, I can imagine certain literature, certain languages where the obvious assessor or expert is also the main known translator, which either means a, a conflict of interest or that those literatures won't get submissions. And since one of the purposes is precisely to draw out lesser translated languages, that could be a problem. And also, do the translators have to live in the UK? Because, again, that might provoke a problem of, for instance, translations from many South Asian literatures where most of the translators from, say, Tamil or Telugu don't live in the UK. So, um, To answer the second part of your question first, it's not where the translators are based, it's where the publishers are based. So I don't think that's a problem, is it? So the tra No, that doesn't matter. The first part of your question... Um, the conflict of interest, I think that's something we would have to do on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, if, you know, the expert does happen to be the translator and it is a language that's very, very, very difficult to find anyone else, I think that's something we would have to discuss at the time. Would you agree with that? I think so. I, mean, I think, as, 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 as Roz said, there will be a conflict of interest declaration. I think we have to assume that people are capable of, of writing an objective assessment of a book, it may then be that they then go on to be the translator of, of that book. But I don't, I don't think, as you say, in those cases where with very, very small languages, I don't think what we don't want is the scenario you outline where you end up being unable to, to support translations. I think we will, we're going to have to watch that one. I think yeah. so much of what we're announcing today is like we've done so much scenario planning, what, and, and really Emma and Roz have done so much thinking this through. And we have to give them a lot of credit for that. And some of it we're going to have to think through in practice over the next year or two 
and maybe refine in due course. But and, it and wouldn't be excluded. We certainly think, wouldn't exclude it for no, that reason. No, I, I think a couple more hands up here. Quick question about double funding. If we're applying for a translation support, and at the same time we're offered, say, by the Slovaks or Turks, one of their subsidies, which we usually use to pay the agent or the author as an advance on royalties, does that count as double funding? Only the translation. We're funding the translation. If you've got funding from elsewhere to fund another part of the fine. project, Thank that's fine. Much. Not for the translation. And there was one right in front here. Yeah, this lady here. What will be the application deadline for this first, um, the first round of grants? Um, Emma? Emma? She gone? Um, I think June, June, June or something. Yeah, I, I can't remember off the top of my head, but you are given more than 24 hours to fill in the form. Also, um, I think we should say, did, did you mention, I think Emma has got, Emma, you have got some copies of the application <laughs> form, which we can... 8th of June. 8th of so June. the form will be live tonight, and you've got till the 8th of June. And I think if people do you want to distribute the forms now? Yeah, Just or, pass or, them around. Or, or, or mob Emma at the end for them. Yeah. Um, was there another hand that I saw? Yes, here, Nikki. I wondered if I could, before we go, uh, announce the last event tomorrow night of two Chinese authors. So it's not a question. Can I make an no. announcement? Yeah. Now? Yes, 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 now, as you've got the mic. Got the yes. mic. Okay, right. <laughs> Um, some of you may have seen the uh, Pen World Atlas blog last week, had a Chinese writer called uh, Han Dong. Some of you may have seen Words Without Borders, short story by another writer who's here, Xu Zhechen. They are both going to be at the British Library tomorrow night, 6.30, as uh, is Julia Lovell, and I'm going to be there. It's going to be a really good, lively, hard-hitting discussion. These are very outspoken authors, so do come. British Library tomorrow night, 6.30. Thank you. Thank you, Nikki. I think we've heard a lot about how, um, how entrepreneurial translators are these days, and Nikki um, <laughs> exemplifies that. Yes, I, I know there's a hand over just yeah. outside. Oh, sorry, inside first. Yeah. Okay. Yes, this lady sitting down first. Yeah. Uh, I want to know, is there an obligation for the publisher to acknowledge uh, English Pen for, for having funded the project? Is there an obligation? Yes. Yes. And okay. the Arts Council. Okay. Yes. Yes. We hope not. I mean, not to the exclusion of all other information on the cover. Okay. It's, not, it's not like the health warning on new cigarette packets. All right. Yeah. But it will be that, there. That's in, all in the contract. In the yeah. mix. And if you could pass it to the lady outside. Could someone help pass the microphone? Thank you. Um, I've got a question if the book in the original language is not available because it's either out it's of... It's not what, sorry? It's not available which means it's either out of print or the publisher ceased to exist because we actually have that situation. But we have to book in the PDF format because the author has it. So the question is, is it okay for you to accept it or if the book in the paperback is simply not available? It's a question of the rights situation. I mean, you would need to find the rights holder and make sure that you do have the right to publish that book in English. We have the rights, but the actual book in the original language is not available on the market in the original country anymore. But we do have a PDF. Oh, yes, that's, that's all we need, problem, isn't it? Yeah, we, just, so we, we a want PDF a manuscript that someone okay. can read. As long so as you've got a copy for the translator yeah, to work yeah, sure, from. Sure, sure. <laughs> yes. Thank you. <laughs> Are there any more hands up? Yes, over on this side. I don't think we may. Is that the last one? Any more hands? Yes, I was wondering about books that are not in the public domain and books that are out of copyright. If there had been, say, a very, very old English translation of it and someone wanted to do a new translation, would that be considered or would it, that fall into the ineligible because it's not contributing something new to English readership? Sorry. I think, I think, I think the truth is, let me, let me hazard an answer. It's as, as ever with these things, new problems arise that we haven't anticipated. I would imagine that book would score very low on the diversity point because if someone wanted, they could find that translation. But if it scored incredibly highly on the quality and the strength of the project, maybe it would be in with a chance. Well, it depends on, I think it depends on the previous translation. And I think the publisher would have to give a very good rationale for wanting to retranslate it. So, I mean, there might be books where the translation had been censored in some way. Um, I mean, you know, if 
that the second sex was recently republished because it was discovered that the first transla translation had censored Simone de Beauvoir. So I think if we got a very good reason for wanting to do a new translation, then it would be perfectly acceptable, no? Yeah, I think exactly, exactly, yes. Are there, are there any more? We're, we're, we're slightly out of time, but I mean, I don't want to curtail, yes, is there? Okay, sorry, we've got 15 minutes. I'm being, um, I'm censoring the discussion. <laughs> I didn't mean to. I thought we began at half past. It's quarter two. Sorry. Uh, I'm not a publisher, but I'm a writer. I write book in, not in English, in my mother tongue. That's Bengali. So could you give us some advice? If I feel that my book should be translated in English, what we should be doing? That's, I need a bit of advice on that. I'm not a publisher, I'm a writer. Okay. <laughs> What advice on getting published in English? Yeah, yeah getting translation first, then publish. <laughs> find a translation. So they, do, do we yeah. have to find a publisher ourselves? And then they will uh, talk to the pain about translation. What is the procedure? I think there are all sorts of different <laughs> ways um, that books find publishers. Sometimes translators act as champions. So if you find a translator who likes your work and wants to translate it, translators do then approach publishers. Um, publishers do sometimes read different languages. So, you know, um, what language do you write in? I write in Bengali. Bengali. I, I've written 54 books in Bengali. Write, in, write yeah. here and go to Bangladesh yeah. and get published in there. Yeah. So I feel that some of the books can be is translatable and can be published in here, but I don't know how to yeah. go about it. <laughs> um, I mean, I think this is quite a big and separate discussion. <laughs> yeah, it is. Um, so maybe we can talk about it afterwards, because okay. we might have some more questions about the, the project, okay? okay? Thank you very much. I'll be around afterwards. Okay, thank you. Are there any more? Yes, the gentleman towards the back. Uh, is there a time limit um, after the award of the grant uh, mm -hmm. after which the book has to have been published? Does it have to be yeah. published within a certain it's time? Two years, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's two years from when the contracts are signed because obviously once the publishers got the news that they've got the grant, they then have to do all the paperwork with the foreign rights holder, etc., etc. So once they're ready to go, it'll be two years. I mean, if there are no more questions, then I think we can, we can, we can, we can wrap up. And, but I think I'm sure people will want to continue chatting to, to Roz and, and Emma, who is there. And Emma, like I said, Emma has got copies of the, the application form. I think it makes most sense if people actually apply by downloading the form from the website. But you might like to have a look at it now, and it might bring up other questions that you want to ask us after the event. But I think let me again thank Antonia and Arts Council England very deeply for their support and confidence in English Pen and Nicholas Smith, who's been really uh, um, very hardworking on this. Uh, and um, I hope we repay that confidence uh, um, you know we're going to do our best it's going to be a work in process I think you know we want to be an intelligent and useful funder in this sector and that's going to be a learning experience and I think we're going to use this uh, the translation center and international translation day over the next couple of years to provide a chance to come back and have conversations like this so it's, it's going to be a, col a collaborative venture and I think this afternoon's discussion has been a great beginning to that but I, I now declare uh, the Pen Translates Fund officially launched. Thank you. Yeah.